Good evening, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Welcome to the first Wednesday series. My name is Dor. My lovely co-host's name is Lauren. She'll be up in a minute. Um, and I just want to welcome you all and welcome our guest reader tonight, Phil Lynch. Before we start the program, just because this is, this is a very important piece of information that I often forget, I'd like to thank um, Limerick City and County Council and the Creative Communities folks for enabling us to have the series, pay our readers for the series, pay the people who put a lot of work into the series. Um, so thanks to a Made in Limerick grant, we're able to be here. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and for those of you, those of you who know Phil Lynch know we're in for a treat tonight, but I just want to give those of you who don't know Phil just a couple of words about him. Phil Lynch's poems have appeared in a range of literary journals and anthologies. His work has been featured in poetry and arts shows on RTE, on local radio, etc. He's attended pretty much a lot of series in Ireland um, and abroad, in Belgium, France, the UK, USA. He has also been involved in organizing and hosting events and is currently a coordinator of the Words by the Sea monthly open mic night. His latest collection, Moving On, from Salmon Poetry, which we have on sale here for a mere 10 euro, uh, came out in April. And his previous collection, In a Changing Light, which we just have a couple of copies for, is also out there, also for a tenor. We encourage you to also buy them and support poetry. Also from Salmon, and that was published in 2016. So no more for me. Phil, thank you so much for being here this evening, and let's move on to the poetry. Hi, uh, good evening everyone, and thanks very much to Dora for that introduction, and thanks indeed to Dora and Lauren and Dominic too for having this event and for uh, letting me be part of it this evening. So, um, the first Wednesday uh, resonates with me because Dora mentioned I host uh, one in the area of Dublin, and it's on the second Wednesday. And we can call it Words by the Sea, but anyway, Wednesdays are obviously popular poultry days. Um, what I plan to do is to uh, take you on a little bit of my own poetic journey, I suppose, and uh, I will select sort of a, a random enough selection from the two collections, uh, mainly. And um, so, let's get on with it. Yeah. So this uh, first one is from my, my new collection, uh, it's a short one, and it's called Drifters. We are drifters. Shifting in shadows of doubt, lost in a landscape of half-withered thought. We talk to everyone and no one. We argue with ourselves about how we got here and why. We fantasize our lives into what we are not, because we do not know what we are. It feels good in the moment, until the moment passes, and we are adrift again, in the unsettled space between our state of being and how it will end. Thank you. I'm going to drift right back. We were all drifters, I suppose, all the time, drifting from, from something or towards something, pretty much. Uh, I'm going to drift back to my very early childhood now, and one of my earliest memories, uh, which is still one of the probably more exciting things I've witnessed. And uh, that was the arrival of electricity to my then childhood home. And uh, that was back in the day when uh, my father was out in the fields working, didn't know that the final connection had been made to the house, and the plot was that we wouldn't have the lamp lighting as usual when he's coming in in the evening. So I was the youngest around, was given a leading role in this uh, drama, and uh, it was all back in the day of cowboy films and Cold Wars and all that, so there's a references in there. To it. It's called Changing Light. It was nearly dark when he came in from the fields, tired from the toils of the day, ready to complain about the tilly lamp 
still overlit. Will you have to light it himself? He asked, of no one in particular. In the shadow of an empty space beneath the stairs, I stood primed. The men with the metal boots, their belts heavy as the gunslingers, had spent what seemed like years digging holes to plant the creosote forest that stretched across the countryside, with giant spools of wire unfurled along roads and lanes and fields. I marveled at how the scale the heights of those black poles had worked at right angles to the ground without falling, stunting them all. In the countdown to those sky waited, finger on the switch as if to take its pulse, or like some general in the Kremlin with his thumb on the red button waiting for the order to push. The predetermined signal came from my mother at the table, and with all the strength in my bony digit, I flicked the magic switch. Outside, the dusk turned instantly to dark. Inside, the light would never be the same. And it wasn't. No. <laughs> it probably, seems, probably seems a bit archaic to some, uh, to imagine electricity only coming to us, but um, it's, I, I, I tend to equate it with the advent of the internet in terms of the yeah. impact it made at the time. In all, sorts, in all sorts of ways, and it's, it's always useful to remember when I do that, I usually say that I think at the last count I saw there was about three quarters of a billion people who don't have domestic electricity in the world still, and that's the official figure, so it's probably even much more now, where am I? Yeah, um, reference my parents there, a lot of this new collection, well the first part of it at least, has a lot to do with my parents and myself growing up around them and um, family and memories of that kind and I'm going to do a couple of that now for you um, from it. Uh, this first one, it was, I grew up in a very remote rural part of the North Midlands and this is I suppose an attempt to capture the carefreeness of that kind of childhood. It's called Stepping Stones. We hop on stepping stones to cross the river on the way home from school. And where the water narrows its furrow, we learn through bets, dares and bravado to jump from bank to bank. We run free-spirited as the rain through wildflowered fields, climbing gates, jumping stiles. We are high jumpers and pole vaulters, riders of booking broncos, Play cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers, spies and spy catchers, goodies and baddies, all in one day. The only barrier to our stride is when it comes to sleep. Even then, our minds continue to chase adventure of all kinds. Snipers on the loose near the house. Behind, we dive to hide behind a giant planet turf. Something moves inside the shed. A head pops out and shouts, you're dead. When lights creep back to tap the glass, we crank up our boisterous engines and mingle with the whir and rattle of machines at work, the beat of barking dogs, and all the other moving parts of life being lightly lived, oblivious of the burden weighing of the ones who make it home. And the ones, the ones who make it home, of course, were the, the parents for the most part. And um, I want to read one now that brings the two of them into closer focus. And it's called Reading the Sundays. After Sunday dinner, in the middle of the day, they retreated to their regular chairs to read the Sunday papers, the Sunday Independent and Sunday Review. Later, the Sunday World, Press and Tribune all became part of the mix. As with the dailies, Dad's first focus fell on the death notices. To make sure I'm not among them, he would joke, while noting funerals to be attended, before proclaiming, there are people dying today who never died before. Calling out snippets to each other from various articles, their tone of voice revealing whether the item found favour or was being frowned upon. The source usually informed the tone. The more official, the greater the scorn. Sections were swapped over as each was read until the papers were fully exchanged, their order rearranged and some parts discarded in keeping with my parents' interpretation of the news and articles therein. Dozing off mid-read was part of the ritual. 
pages crumpling like rumpled blankets on their laps or hanging sideways, half on the ground in a disordered tussle. This was their day of rest, unless something of a higher order pressed itself onto the agenda. Some sunny Sundays, Van converted the car in the yard into her personal conservatory to finish the papers and grab a peaceful nap, while Dad lay back in his chair snoring and dreaming that his much-wished-for six-day cow had at last come to pass. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> anyone who's not familiar with cows <coughs> need to know that they have to be milked. I don't know whether it's still the case, I presume it is. Uh, morning and night, 365 days a year or so. Um, there's always a logistical conundrum if you have to go away anywhere to get neighbours in or how to do it. So he was always bemoaning the fact that other workers had a five and a half or six day a week, so why couldn't he and the cow? <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. Um, so right, uh, moving on then um, to my late teens, <coughs> late teens, early twenties, I um, suppose I spent a lot of time in dimly lit kind of places uh, with many of my peers drinking lots of liquid out of big glasses and talking about how we were going to change the world. And uh, then we all moved on. But uh, nowadays a few of us still meet up to reminisce. And when we do, we'll be sitting in dimly lit places drinking out of big glasses, <laughs> talking about how we used to do that and talking about changing the world. So that's the thought behind this. It's called Smoke Without Fire. The doctor and the dentist greet the scientist. They drink a toast to olden days. In their glasses, reflections of their student years. Cheers. No cheering crowds hail the worker as he makes his way through narrow streets to meet his learned friends. They raise another glass, another past embraced. The conversation takes them back to dingy bars and dodgy all-night party places, to great debates on questions scarcely understood. The more they learned, the more they seemed to lose, but no one kept a balance sheet. They talk of how they, they talk of how they for the how they for the glory days to come, how everything would be different after the revolution, how it would be for real this time. There would be a call to arms, a conscription of words, an awakening. The voices of rebels would be heard over those of primates and presidents, the poets and the protest singers would write the new anthems everything would be different. No one saw the future creep up, becoming part of the past they meant to change. Now, in their pursuing way, it is those glorious days that raise the cheers when comrades gather to commemorate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the moral of that story is a few of do, if you're talking about doing something, go and do it, don't just talk about it. So, uh, uh, moving on then, of course, the next thing we drift into, if we're lucky, is this thing called love. And um, drift out of it again as well, sometimes that's another poem. But um, this is a sort of the subject is love itself and encounters we might have with it along the way. It's called Encounters. I might have met you once while on the road, but how was I to know you would be there? No map to guide, no picture to compare, so why would I have stopped or even slowed? And yet, if you had signaled me your code, I would have shyly shuffled, unaware that you and I could have so much to share. I'd still to learn what nature had bestowed. But later, when we met, I knew you well, although I least expected you to be so blissful, yet so able to confound. Instead of catching me when first I fell, you put me in a boat that's still at sea in search of shores which never may be found. Okay, so moving on then, a bit of poetry came along, and um, it didn't have to come along a while before that, but uh, poems, we don't know really where they come from, I suppose we have some modicum of control over them while we're trying to shake them up and then, and then when they leave again they're they're we have no control. So that's kind of the thought behind this. It's called whispers. I can only speak of what is in me. The rest I must assemble and diffuse. A blackbird parks and fills me with its song. Bright daffodils push back the darker shades. 
Great oak trees sift the air to let me breathe. Fresh dew relieves my early morning thirst. All these the seeds for thoughts that form the words I mold and whisper to the breeze, which wafts them off to places out of reach, to seep through sand into the depths of seas and rise to rest upon a fertile beach, and there take root to bloom anew, sweet food for bees. I scatter thoughts in words to spread afar, like stars send light to whisper to the night. Thank you. Um, so, out into the wider world, then, um, where the, well, I don't say we're in the throes of the people in the States are in the throes of the uh, election time at the moment, and there recently we marked the, what would have been Leonard Cohen's 90th anniversary, or 90th, 90th birthday, and um, you might say, what's the connection between those two? Well, on the day in 2016 that it was announced that Donald Trump had won the election. Um, same day news came that Leonard Cohen had passed away. So, as I say, I was a fan of one of those. <laughs> um, uh, Leonard Cohen was a big influence on me in terms of his poetry and his lyrics and his imagery and emotion. So, um, there's a few words of his in this, borrowed from his, his uh, song, The Future. And this is called Lullaby to a Lost Future which was written just after that, that period in November 2016. The sudden thud of darkness falling down impacted like a punch, a big capow, as in some comic strip. Who's laughing now? This darkness shrouds another kind of clown. A poet picked this, this moment to depart. He left us his vision of disorder. Said he'd seen the future. It was murder. We wonder now what Leonard meant. The start of time when freedoms will be put on hold, a portent of a deadly darker age, blue light projected on an empty stage, plain truths denied by lies that will unfold and gather like a poison to be puked. But beauty still will flourish in the roots of trees no longer free to bear new fruits. All those who live for flowers when rebuked in search of sleep, we count each petal to bloom and dream of landscapes only they can see. Great landscapes, where again they will be free to hold a light to shift this heavy gloom. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the, the gloom has got, has got worse uh, across the world and it's still getting worse. Anyway, we still hope for the light. Um, I don't know why that reminds me of fake news, but um, it is very difficult now to know what sources are genuine or what isn't. And uh, my, my, my recipe is that if you want to get close to the truth, you ask people, those who are affected by something and those who have caused the effect. That's the thought behind this. It's just called ask. If you don't know, Ask those who have no money. Ask those who have no home. Ask those who have no jobs. Ask those who had to leave. Ask those who had to flee. Ask those with no voice. Ask the money makers. Ask all the politicians. Ask opinion shapers. Ask civil servants. Ask the teachers. Ask the clerics. Ask the street. Ask yourself. Ask. <laughs> All right, soon let you get on with your open mic and be free. <laughs> um, so we're going to do something a little lighter, and uh, it, it's, it's just a rhyme that kids, for kids, kind of in a way, but um, it's called I Like Poetry, um, which I do, but uh, sometimes. I worry that people still would like to keep it behind a gateway or a doorway or someplace, maybe out of some notion that it might get contaminated or something. So, Mr. Walt, this is called I Like Poetry. I like the P in poetry. 
who leaves and comforts me to pee. Without it, we would have poetry. <laughs> that wouldn't quite do it, you see. I like the O in poetry too. It opens up such wondrous sounds around to let the others through. How dull if O was out of bounds. I like the E in poetry, yes, soft and strong. It's doubly blessed. Without it, beats could be a mess. Sometimes I think it is the best. The T in poetry does poet make, and poetry sounds a little weak. It may be flat, but no mistake, the T is used to twist and tweak. The R has surely earned its place. It protects us from being poetry faced. It would truly be a great disgrace for our R to be erased. The Y, oh my, it so completes it. But all the questions that arise, how, if why should be deleted, could we ever ask all those whys? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll just finish up with a short one again. And um, thanks again to Dora and Lauren and Dominic for letting me down here. Uh, it's great to get out of Dublin every now and again. And uh, thank you all for listening. Hope you like some of the words. If you didn't, thank you for listening anyway. Uh, it's always nice to have a listening audience. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, back to there's a bit of love. and. Um, this is called, My Wife Thinks that I'm Not a Poetry Reading. <laughs> <laughs> My wife thinks I'm at a poetry reading. The truth is, I am. But I keep all my best words, all the here in my chest words, all my bare and undressed words, all the never mind the weather words, all the keeping us together words, all the under my breath words, the no need to be said words, the all in my head words. I keep them all, like the best wine, except not for the last time, but like every time is first time. And so, for my next poem, I don't know, that one's for later, when I get home. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I look forward to the mic, so I look forward to the mic. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a five-ish minute break. In the meantime, when we come back from the break, as we do here every month, we're going to pass around um, a clipboard with a poster from tonight's event, and you can write Phil some appreciation and messages about tonight. Be nice. <laughs> Be nice. And while we're on break, just a little reminder, those books are for sale for 10 euros outside. See you in five minutes. How's everyone doing? Good. 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 Awesome. Um, so how brilliant is Phil Lynch? Thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. Um, I remember when I started off this whole mad uh, poetry thing, which is about 10 years ago now, which is kind of scary, just hearing about a fantastic group of poets up in Dublin, spoken word poets, who were running Lingo Poetry Festival, among other things. And we had Stephen James Smith, Colin Keegan, Aaron Fornoff, one Mr. Phil Lynch. Are you hearing anybody? Mm -hmm. and, and just thinking about the fact that this whole spoken word poetry world existed in Ireland and people were working in it and people were making things happen and I think I always have a special place in my heart for poets who both inspire and create opportunities for other poets um, and I think to Phil Lynch and to all of those poets I would like to say thank you And speaking of giving some platforms to their poets, we have a very exciting open mic tonight. Uh, so, to kick us off, 
as is tradition, we have the one, the only, Mr. Dominic Taylor. This is a little bit of tongue-in-cheek stuff. And uh, we, you know, most of you will know we published uh, Lauren's book there last month or the month before, uh, Quarter Life Crisis. And um, in the book, so it's a bit of fun really, okay? Three Quarter Life Crisis. I'm well past middle age. And at that forgiving stage, unforgiving stage, but only comfort foods bring any cheers. Yes, I know I need to act my years. But the world won't meet me there. I'm just a fat old fool with graying hair. It mocks and jeers, leaving me confused. My days have nearly run, and I stand accused. And yes, I'm having a three-quarter life crisis. <laughs> My younger days were just a ball of fun, but little did I know of what was to come. The bills, they still need to be paid, and there's no nest egg left for me to raid. But this, this is nothing like before. I have bills, but my pension can't pay them anymore. I still must work hard every day. I must rise up early, or else get no pay. And yes, I think I'm having a three-quarter life crisis. I'm simply trying to keep my life intact, yet no one seems to care if I'm on track. Life took a twisted, cruel turn, and after all these years you'd think I'd learn. Too late to start chasing youth again. Back then life was fun, but now all I've left is pain. And all that money I have paid in income tax, I still need to borrow from, from my children and loan sharks. No wonder I'm having a three-quarter life crisis. Yes, I remember the good times and all that laughter of everyone living happily ever after. But the good old days of wine and roses have become a daze with lots of doses. And those of you of a certain age will know that partners don't want to sit around being bored. They expect you to still be the life and soul of the party, even though you're floored after one or two Bacardis. So right now, I'm having a three-quarter life crisis. Yes, being an elder citizen can make life harsh. It can drain you of decorum and panache. You keep keeping on and failing better, hoping the batteries won't fail in your pace setter. And like McCartney, I too yearned for yesterday, when love and Valentine seemed always here to stay. No, aging is not something I welcome with glee. And turning 64 isn't all it's cracked up to be. I guess I'm just having a three-quarter life crisis. Thank you. I didn't want to be the one to have to say it's on the next question. Very hard. <laughs> that was a brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I got a message from a woman the other day who, she's a friend of my aunt's and she bought the book and she just turned 19 and she feels like she's having her fourth quarter life crisis. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking, you find someone having a midlife crisis and the four of us go on tour. <laughs> it's going to be great. Generation game. Generation game. I'm going to make so much poetry money. <laughs> they all that income tax. <laughs> Thank you. That was brilliant, Dominic. Thank you so much. Um, okay. As is also kind of tradition, I think, our second poet of the night, I'm going to pass it over to Miss Cora Peters. Woo! Tommy Fitz's punk shop. Limerick early 80s. We were punk rock, knee-high docks, Multicolored mohawk locks, counterculture dark wave got we rocked, but we were lost. And all we had were spliffs and chips, social kips, mavericks, misfits. Then Tommy Fitz, the coolest man in Ireland, opened up a punk shop in his basement. And I found my tribe, imbibed with scribes, got drunk with punks, Sid Vicious, so delicious, Susie Sue and Johnny Rotten, all on cotton t shirts on the wall. Black lights, fishnet tights, bondage pants of polyvinyl chloride, 
draped in chains. Then Tommy put the records on. The Smiths, the Slits, the London Calling album signed by every member of the Clash. And Robert Smith to miss you, kiss you, love cat, cool cat, lounged and listened, lived and loved the counter life when bound from strife. You brought a bit of London home from Limerick, Tommy Fitz, and I'm relatively sure you saved my life. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Cora. Okay, another couple of years you can do your quarter life crisis. <laughs> <laughs> um, up next, we have our last poet who pre booked, Mr. Anthony Lennon. Wickedness of Jack Spratt and the Misses. He has three wigs and two pigs. She has a way of avoiding people. On the corridor wall approaching their bedroom, that neon lit plaque, put there by the pair of them 43 and a half years ago, still blinking its reminder. Variety blows your mind. He holds her hand wherever they go. She holds her wished until pished. <laughs> That's the first one. That's the one. This one is called, Did Someone Mention Forgiveness? My spelling is brutal. Beyond the beyonds. Which, which beyond might that be? Where the white rabbit, assiduous and frazzled, is endowed with nothing for Jack's paper but a pair of rusted from complete overuse brittle pads. That beyond. Irish people, we have a great sense of language, and I've always thought, I think, hold your wish is my favourite phrase. <laughs> it's such a beautiful piece of writing. <laughs> so, now, poetry and art, you know, it's all about individuality and difference. There shouldn't be competition, but I just want to check in. How is the, the first Wednesday series holding up to the second Wednesday series? Pretty, pretty, well. pretty good. Pretty good? Pretty <laughs> good? But we get the best guests, to be fair. <laughs> Um, up next, we have the brilliant Kirano Grifa. Yeah, I am writing a set of, po of, of thoughts at the moment for my sins. And um, I've been lucky in life uh, to have a, a, a small group of close friends, the friends to help me navigate the world. And this song is it, it, called Friendship. Friendship. A sense of truth is something sometimes mute in the cut and thrust of this world entire. But with you, friend, that real truth is mute, filtered by your kindness and your desire to gently ease the weight of the other. In so doing, your burden may be eased, but to reduce this sharing to such barter makes of the intimate a choice disease. What will I be without knowing of you? It's a loaded question, fraught with doubt. There are times I carry you in all I do, times your gifts I couldn't do without, so that each parting evokes a gentle loss, your viewpoint bringing flavour to the sauce. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Carol. Brilliant as always. And speaking of brilliant as always, next up we have Mr. Michael Jurek. Hi, um, I don't know what to call it, coincidence or serendipity, but uh, Phil Lynch's uh, poem on electrification 
is the cue for my poem. Uh, next year, I think, marks the centenary of the beginning of the Shannon Scheme, uh, the project that uh, electrified most of the country and uh, also transformed the landscape between Killaloo and Limerick. Uh, so, getting in ahead of the posse, uh, I decided to write this poem called Waiting for the Shannon Scheme. A new century, a new state escaping the past, waiting for a switch to light the future, preparing for head race, embankments, bridges, hydro dam, pen stocks, turbines, tail race, for a miracle of German engineering and Irish labor, McLaughlin's brainchild, or McGilligan's white elephant, waiting for the Shannon scheme. A parking, a little port at either end, parting weir splitting the majestic Shannon, ready to send the head race hurtling towards the dam. Parting a lax, waiting to guide the tail race to Corbally, to reunite it with the mother stream. Kildurus and Ballyglass waiting for the trains and excavators. The Shannon, an Irish Yukon. Ardna Prussia, an Irish Klondike. The air around Clonlara, thick with a babble of tones. Hiberno-English, German, Connemara Gaelic. Four languages if you include bad language. Laborers in bunkhouses, pigsties and barns. Hired and fired for 32 shillings a 52 hour week. Upstream, meadows of Kilestri and Tunfada, waiting for the deluge, the watery backlash that would consign them to the bottom of a new lower lake, a mini Loch Derg. St. Flannan's Oratory, salvaged from a doomed Friars Island, transplanted stone by numbered stone to solid ground on the site of King Cora at the Green in Killaloo. Meanwhile, in Ireland, sorry, meanwhile, in Ireland, waiting for men to shin up poles, for cables to scrawl parallels across the sky, for nodules to erupt from kitchen walls, to conjure at one flick unshadowed light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I've been changing things up a little bit this month. Um, usually, when I go to the White House and I'm doing this, after I introduce the poet, I stand there. But now, the new speaker is in my way. There's been serious problems. Um, but it's also probably a good, or, well, maybe a good thing or a bad thing. It's kind of ruined my plan of. If you look back over photos of previous White Houses that the wonderful Pat always takes. Uh, <laughs> doesn't get enough credit. Um, I am in the background of like every photo. <laughs> 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 um, and in the beginning it was unintentional. <laughs> and after a while I kind of just thought to myself, at some point, we'll probably have like a future Nobel Prize winner come through here, and I'll just be like, oh, I knew them. He's a photo of me. <laughs> um, so it's kind of ruined my plan now. So uh, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Up next, we have the brilliant Mr. John Pinchnet. Good evening. Tonight I'm reading a short piece that I wrote in 2013. After blackberry picking, autumnal equinox, 22 September 2013. After blackberry picking, keeny and frost on my mind, near sunrise, quickly heading home on my north, south, west, east walk 
to Balinar Graveyard, just as I came to the Ash and Sycamore Bower before Liz and Cyril's home, suddenly full sun hit my back. There was my thin, grotesquely elongated, fast-moving shadow over a hundred meters long, centered in the quick, bright surround, torso, arms, and legs, dangling to the right, the Safeway Blackberry bag, its logo, Ingredients for Life, in my purple-stained hand. And in that passage of gold, I was a reverse new grain solstice shaft of shadow playing out into infinity. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Wonderful as always. And it's always nice to get the, the regulars here and just hear, you know, once you start to really get to know someone's work, I think you can hear it enough times. I mean, it's really, I just really start looking forward to hearing it then every month from so many people we have that come in every first Wednesday. And thank you. Thank you for coming back. Speaking of which, up next we have Miss Beth Denny. Hi, A New Age of Darkness. When books are burned, in the end, people will burn. From the German poet Heinrich Hein in the Nazi era. In 443 BC, the office of censor was created in Rome to mold and shape the character of the people. In 399 BC, Socrates was ordered to take a potion of hemlock <coughs> for the crime of advancing new philosophies. And China's censorship laws date back 1,700 years. Without dreams and ideas, nothing flourishes. But what of the world we live in now? We're stepping out of line of the official diktat is perceived as a dire threat. In less than a generation, we have moved from liberty to tyranny. The chill of draconian laws has led to self-censoring. But freedom of speech is an inalienable right recognized in our Constitution. Our dopey leaders mindlessly follow dystopian agendas planned by furtive actors posing as philanthropists. Build back better, you will own nothing and be happy. A nightmare in store for a sovereign people, dehumanized and fearful. Um, thank you so much, Pat. That was wonderful. Um, next up for our open mic is uh, Miss Laura McNamara. <laughs> <laughs> Give a round of applause. <laughs> I needed that, thank you. Um, I had been planning on doing quarter life crisis tonight, but Dominic's still not there. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, but yeah, so as I, I haven't done a poem in a while, but I need to advertise this book. <laughs> this is quarter life crisis. And we and have copies over there. We do. And we'll be close rate tonight for 15 euro. <laughs> Actually, yeah, we have copies over there, but um, everyone's been buying Phil's book instead. <laughs> Um, so Phil, your book is your book is ten euro, Phil, isn't it? So I'm thinking, you know, what we could do is you could buy Phil's book for ten, mine for fifteen, and we'll only charge you fifty euro. It'll be fine. It'll be, fine. It'll be good fun. But um, I think, and I've said to someone, like all I've ever wanted growing up, and I think many people in this room might feel the same. All I've ever wanted was to have my own book. And thank you. And now that I have my own book. 
all I ever want is to get rid of the fucking thing. <laughs> 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 I do love it, but we have a big box. The thing is, Lord, everybody here probably has it already. Mm, if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Cora bought my first ever copy. I did. I, um, um, and that's why I love Cora so. No, no. <laughs> I love you too. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read the poem <laughs> after all that. And I'm trying to think, I like to try and, you know, do something new. So I'm trying to think of ones I haven't done either in the White House at all, or in a while. And um, so I came upon this one. And I usually perform it, but I'm also trying to get used to reading it from the book, because it's good at <laughs> uh, So this poem is called Between Breaths. I can see you in a maternity ward where the spectrum of life is at its most extreme. I can feel you, wrapping your rain-sized hands around my fingers you learn to breathe. And we sit in awe, terrified we might forget. We take you home, the place where you first stand and dance and laugh and where you learn to love chicken nuggets. And you constantly wonder why they share a name with your favourite funny-looking feathered farm animals from the picture books we read at night. Me with a soft voice, and you with your mother's eyes. I can see you, going to school on your first day, the sky threatening whenever breaking, barely holding back the rain, and the teachers have to bribe you away because you don't want to leave. Not because you're afraid, but because you see the fear in my eyes, and I'll say, just breathe, to you. But really, to me. And I fill up with pride as you go in and make friends by simply being yourself and your introduction to independence becomes a tremendous success and you become a teacher's dream because you are kind. I can see you going so fast, too fast. And you're nervous and tripping over words and I say baby just breathe as you proceed to come out to your lesbian parents as straight. And we will love you all the same, though we won't understand this choice that you made. And you bring home a partner of the opposite sex. And we initially just pretend to be okay until we realize they make you smile. The way you used to smile when you were small and you found the secrets of the world in the garden on the summer's eve. And then we learn to love them too for real. I can see you. Graduating from college. Throwing your cap up in the air knowing how hard you worked to get there. And me being so amazed by what you've done. We take a step, you take a step, you take. You take a deep breath and climb those steps to receive your license into adulthood. And I'm thankful for all the candles your grandmother lit. And then you're embarrassed because I keep telling your professors the story about the chicken nuggets. <laughs> I can see you immigrating for work. Because it will still not be a country for the young. And my heart will break and never truly mend except briefly in a visit home at Christmas. And I can see you calling less and less as the kids and work and life to get more of your time and you won't have a moment to breathe, but you'll still text once a week to say, I love you. I can see you. I can see all the things you could have been and all the memories we would have shared and all the joy and pain and heartbreak that I would have felt all the time, all at once. I can see us saying goodbye as our eyes meet and we both try would fail to breathe. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> um, next up, Martin, if you'd like to take the stage. Get up on our I'm to lower the tone slightly. There's a dog who lives next door to us. He gets right on my wick. He barks all day and he barks all night. I hate the little prick. <laughs> the owner doesn't seem to care. She lets him yap and yap. We cannot sleep because of him. So someone needs a slap. My psycho mind is waking too. What action should we take? A pellet gun, a concrete slab, or a poison piece of steak? Yeah, I should know that it's not his fault. He is only just a dog. He just hates being left alone in the sun, rain, hail and fog. So what is it that we should do? Sleepless nights are just not much fun. 
Oh, Jesus Christ, he's off again. Where did I leave that gun? <laughs> Martin wasn't sure about reading that tonight. I'm uh, very happy you did. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alan. That's great. Um, next up, we have Clinton. Yes. Yeah. We'll give it up for Clinton. Hello. I feel the need to point out that I usually write these on paper, but uh, I was not planning on speaking, and so I'm reading it off my phone. Just, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm too new school. <laughs> so I feel like we all could relate a little bit to trying to sleep and not being able to. And then your brain says, well, hey, you know what would be a fun activity right now? Let's think about all of the mistakes you've ever made and the things that you regret. <laughs> so in the spirit of that, on the visitors at midnight, at the midnight chime, eyes wide awake, spectre and shade of times past, come to bid you remember an ache. Of those words misspoken, of ones lost within a squall, of the lovers scorned and of those missed in the sprawl, the regrets of actions taken and then again of apprehension, of all you'd call misdeeds, of damage done in need, it's a harsh and punished quiet that helps define the soul. And then again, the warmth of confidence that refines it whole. Time, the great healer and taker in good measure, because nothing given time is allowed to last forever. And all of this considered, now consider this, from your deathbed, will you dwell on any of this? so much good. I haven't actually stayed awake thinking of all my mistakes since last night. <laughs> Is that your first time reading here, Clinton? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Hope it won't be your last time reading here. Welcome back to us. Shouldn't be. Awesome. Um, thank you very much. Um, up next we have our, one of our very own, very brilliant Mr. Tomas Collins. Tommy Collins. Um, I don't think I've told you, Tommy. I, so Tommy he has a book out fairly recently, too, only a couple months ago. Um, two books out. And I sent both of those books to my aunt in Longford, who's a very passionate um, Irish language speaker. And my aunt came to my book launch, bought my book, and gave me a couple of nice little comments, and then just kept asking about your books again. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in my own family, I'm just trying to live up to you. And, Take the stage. <laughs> uh, your aunt tried to talk to me about all the books, but uh, Tom Muldowney kept getting in the way. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Um, so yeah, I had to flip a coin tonight between coming here or going down to Cork because this fabulous book is getting launched down there this evening. Uh, it's the latest edition of Howl. There's a, a few other familiar faces in it. Um, but uh, yeah, they published one of my poems in Irish, so I'll read it in Irish, and then I've got a fairly simple translation of it done as well that I'll read just for anyone who isn't fluent. Fionn. Lian and Priyavohar Flok Lia is a Pertuk, Agus Klokka Bioga, Agus Mor Haragaka Arsa, Gagyal Teresh Kahana Trama Boshti, Shir Agus Ivada Valya. Agus Pleskin Gok Ilaga on Grey, Queen Skal Gok Klee, Is Eid, Queen Vral, Tra, Drik Tool, Shot Nablina, Is Erdera on Taurig, Is Tools and Over, Flan Vui, Kerpra, Gloss, Rua, Bui, Luce on Elistrum, Yerig, Is on Yusha, Shimmer Yarug, Agus Marini on Fuka, On Down Vain, Ig Olivu, On Durkadus, Lutyat. Tespontus Baha Egonru Ogok Skal. So yeah, I did a quick quick translation of that earlier. Uh, title uh, Fion basically means wild. Um, but again, there's, there's different connotations. I, I think that's probably why they picked it. 
goes with the idea of howling and wolves and all that jazz. The main road lies wet and grey between bog and little rocks and ancient boulders, bright after heavy rain showers, out west and far from home. And all known fall colours explode from the clay under the shadow of each fence and ditch, all blooming at this magical time of year, between the end of summer and the chill of autumn, orange, purples, greens, reds and yellows, an inferno of Montbretia and fuchsia, an abundance of red clover and foxglove, the world itself preparing for darkness to come, an exhibition of life shining from every shade. Thank you. You know, Tommy, I came up here and I felt like I was very vulnerable talking to you about my, my family issues. And then you come up and you talk about the new book you got published in and I got rejected from. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're not laughing. <laughs> no, you're uh, laughing with me, not at me, Mark. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, Tommy, you're in the book. Congratulations. Dor, you're in the book as well, I believe. Uh, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Anyone else in the book? <laughs> you afraid to say for the word? It's only Tommy, don't <laughs> um, But yeah, congratulations very much to Tommy and Dora on a yeah. wonderful yeah. publication yeah. today. Yeah. And thank you for spending your publication day with us. <laughs> like, Indeed, yeah. yeah it's fun. <laughs> Up next, we have Mr. Shay Morrissey. Give it up for Shane. Okay, there's a long way to walk. One of these. It's a uh, suggestion. Uh, if somebody like uh, so I'll just read it and it's a short ditty or poem that goes with it that hopefully will make more sense than what I say. Um, as part of just I'd live out in a dare and as part of out in a dare I made a suggestion out there to a community group to a thing called Poems of a Place. The idea is that you have a poem of a place and a postcard be sold in a local place and the local group then would benefit from it as well as retailer and hopefully potentially something for the post. Something uh, a bit more sort of PR than maybe sort of a, a wash of riches. And some of the texts I wrote for this was that by sharing the ordinary and the special that locals know and enjoy, commu communities can add to the appreciation of local places in a way that gives a local benefit. A local cause looking to add to a community and to do some fundraising would lend its name to a poem of a place postcard. Cover the cost of printing and the cards and agree with a local retailer to stock and to sell the cards. So it's very present in the place. By purchasing a stock of postcards and making them available for sale, the local retailer can help promote and benefit the community. Within the community, the local places associated with the poems, and I'm thinking of John's Wall poem, I think it could be a big tourist attraction. Uh, within the community, the local places associated with the poems of a place could be marked and a poem displayed and local retailers stocking the postcards identified. Communities can help encourage, promote and benefit poets and creatives within and connected with a community. There's a little bit of suggestive pricing. The cards would be nice. I mean, a picture of the place, uh, the poem, and it's just a suggestion, uh, if somebody might like to ask a comment or maybe some suggestions of guidance or what might be appropriate or that. And there's a lot of text there. And this is a little bit of poetry, very short that I wrote to go with that, to hopefully have more meaning than all of the text. A postcard of daily life. A place visited and touched. A poem to keep and share. There we go. So if you'd like, there's not many copies there, there's a few copies there with a bit of paper. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
people maybe come up to you afterwards and chat about it if they want, if they have any questions or... Good, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have, which we don't usually have, a small few extra minutes. So before we do have another poet still to come, but I just wanted to see that anybody who hasn't got a chance to read might want to read. We do have another, but I just, just want to throw it out. No worries, no pressure if you don't, but just if there is anyone who didn't get a chance who wants to jump up. Don't worry. You're going to read? Yep. Next one. Not today. Maybe a Maybe a for next one. Oh, okay. So that's why everyone has to come back next one. Right, okay. 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 okay, so before we do the final announcements, we have our final poet of the night, who is one of my favorite poets, Miss Thor Seeker. Oh. Everybody give it up for Thor. I was actually going to read something else because, as usual, I forgot that today was Howl Day. I forget my own birthday every year. Um, but I'm going to read the poem that's in Howl. Um, it's called Solemnization Wingspan, and it's based on my experiences with The Swan by Sansons. It's a cello piece. Solemnization slash wingspan. The swan is about death, said the accompanist for my audition. I thought it was about beauty. The illusion of eternity in a bowl, the gentle resistance of water kissing every pore before releasing it. Arpeggios close the gate, impose emotion. Pianos are but mallets hitting strings, holding down a pedal, sound released under wing. Pianists do not know the yield to gravity, balanced on an elbow's counterweight, the linger to the tip, inexorable return across the bridge towards mother of pearl, circling the gate, accepting the fall. Air goes up, then fades until invisible, but I have perfect pitch. I know middle C, the lodestone, always pointing north, and the swan's last soul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Brilliant as always. Congratulations on your publication, Name of Jealous and the So that is bringing us to a close of another brilliant First Wednesday series. Um, I want to give a quick thank you to our always brilliant Marion over in the book stand. Um, second shout out of the night, Pat on photography. No one else is getting two shout out Pat's just you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dominic Taylor wants to make it all right. The ever wonderful, newly published, and brilliant performer and organizer. Give it up for Dora one more time. And say a quick thank you both to the White House for hosting yeah. us and also to Limerick Arts Office for helping fun tonight, which we are not going to forget to keep saying because it's mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> but also they're very good and it's lovely to be able to fund um, poetry and fun art. Um, and before I give a big thank you to one of our main performers, I just want to make two quick notes. Next month, on top of our fantastic performer here on the open mic, we have Mr. Michael Farry coming to perform. We're very excited about. And also in the next week, and maybe Dominic, you can explain this better, we pretty much have John leading on tour for three performances. Indeed. Liddy Week. So, John Liddy is going to be performing, I wrote this down, there is a list, um, Friday yes. at half seven in the People's Museum. I lost my list. And that's, to, just to yeah. fill in, that's, sure. for, yeah. that's <laughs> for a collection of short stories, some of which he wrote, some of which his brother wrote. They're going to be performing them together in the People's Museum. Then next Wednesday at half seven, they will be here in the White House reading books. With John. Jim Burke. 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 Yeah. 
And then next Thursday, at half seven again, at Key Books, performing. With uh, stories of Robert Graves. Uh, yes. <laughs> Will you be performing in that too? No. no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll still be very good. I <laughs> Um, but yes, thank you all so, so much for coming. As always, you have been a beautiful audience. Yeah. This is one of my favorite nights of the month, every month. And please give it up one more time for our phenomenal guest, Mr. Philip. <laughs> Books will still be on sale for the next few minutes. Support artists. Thank you very much. Good night. Hold on. And last but not least, you don't get away that easily. Thank you to Lauren McNamara.